Hello, everybody. My name is Frank Mitlöner. I'm a professor and air quality specialist in the Department of Animal Science here at UC Davis and also the, direct, the director of the CLEAR Center. And uh, I want to talk to you today about uh, climate and livestock or livestock and climate. Um, I am, as I just said, the director of the CLEAR Center, a center that does research, uh, sustainability research and communications around sustainability. Uh, it is to be found at clear.ucdavis.edu. And a lot of the things that we are talking about here today are available on our webpage. So what's all this talk about greenhouse gases and climate? What do the greenhouse gases do and why is... Uh, why are these uh, a problem? So what you see on this slide depicted here is a schematic of the uh, of the sun radiating down solar uh, radiation to the surface of the earth. Normally that radiation would be reflected back into space if there weren't the so-called greenhouse gases, which effectively form a blanket over the earth's atmosphere, retaining some of that solar heat back in our atmosphere. And this is actually very critical for life on Earth, without uh, this effect, we wouldn't really uh, be able to live here, it would be too cold. The trouble is we humans are producing too many of these greenhouse gases, and that means this blanket is getting too thick, retaining too much of that solar heat in our atmosphere. And so as a result, uh, climatologists will tell you that the main culprit of climate change is humans burning fossil fuels, emitting CO2, carbon dioxide, uh, particularly the critics of animal agriculture uh, want to focus on methane. And yes, methane is a potent greenhouse gas. It is much more potent uh, per molecule than CO2. But as you will see in the next couple of slides, there's much more nuance to this discussion than just saying methane is more powerful. When comparing different greenhouse gases, such as uh, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide to one another, um, a matrix is being used, uh, and it's called the global warming potential. Uh, so just like uh, the police using a breathalyzer when they want to see how much alcohol you've had, uh, and that breath breathalyzer um, just measuring, um, you know, alcohol content of your, of your exhaled breath, uh, not caring whether you drank beer, wine, or vodka, um, this matrix global warming potential um, pretty much arrives at one unit, and that's CO2, uh, carbon dioxide equivalent emissions. And what that means is that if a farm, let's say, produces 10 tons of methane, then all you need to do is multiply the 10 tons from your farm with this GWP100 factor, with this global warming potential factor. So if you emit 10 tons, then that's 10 times 28, and then you arrive at 280 CO2 equivalent uh, emissions of, of methane. So global warming potential, GWP100, has been used for the last 30 years. But uh, people like myself have identified that this issue is, the issue of using this uh, old matrix is actually uh, starting to be problematic. Um, it's a reasonable uh, matrix when you have methane sources going up. But if methane sources, let's say cattle herds are constant and or if they are falling, if methane is, is being reduced, then this uh, GWP100 has really strong limitations, which you will see in a minute. <clears throat> I call methane the fast and furious greenhouse gas. Furious because it has a good punch to it. It's 28 times more potent per molecule than CO2. But fast because it has a very short lifespan. So this graph here shows the so-called global methane budget. In sharp contrast to other greenhouse gases, methane is not just produced, but methane is also destroyed. You see here the global methane budget on the left side, fossil fuel production and use, agriculture and waste, biomass burning, and so on. All of these sources of methane amount to a total of 558 teragrams globally. But in contrast to the other greenhouse gases, this gas is not just produced. On the right side, you see that methane is also destroyed. There are sinks for methane, in other words, and these sinks amount to 548 teragrams. So on the left side, you see 500, let's call it 560 is produced. And on the right side, 550 is destroyed, which leaves the balance 10 in our atmosphere. Still a number we seek to further reduce, but one that's... Uh, 
really important to know because most often people only talk about the emissions and not the sinks. Why is this important that methane has not just emissions, but also sinks? Well, because that makes all the difference um, when it comes to quantifying the impact this gas has on warming. What are these emission sinks? You see here underneath, uh, you see this, this large arrow pointing down and underneath uh, the title sink from chemical reactions in the atmosphere. There is such a, such a thing as an atmospheric removal of methane. And that atmospheric removal occurs because there is a molecule in the air called an, a radical, a hydroxyl radical, and this radical molecule destroys methane. So when it finds a methane molecule, it destroys it. And that generally happens within approximately one decade. The same does not happen to CO2, the same does not happen to nitrous oxide, the other greenhouse gases, but it does happen to methane. And that makes it a very different kind of worms. Why? Because it leads to differences in the lifespan of these gases. Methane has a half-life of a little over a decade, as you can see on this slide, in contrast to approximately a thousand years for CO2. So what this really means is that if you drive a car and you burn fossil fuels, you will put out a gas that stays in the atmosphere for a thousand years. In other words, every time you have ever burned fossil fuels, which are oil, coal, and gas, and every time your parents and grandparents and grand-grandparents did, all of that stuff is still in the air. It will stay in there pretty much forever. But if your cattle belch, then the methane they belch today will replace the methane that they have belched a decade ago. Uh, and that means that leads to a situation where a constant source of, of methane, a constant source of methane does not add additional methane concentration to the atmosphere, and that means no additional warming. If we have near constant emissions of methane, then that means we have near constant uh, warming, no additional warming, and this is what the Paris Climate Accord, uh, Accord is uh, asking us to do, not to cause additional warming. If you reduce methane, then you actually reduce warming, and that is a beautiful thing, obviously, and I will explain that a little bit more. Um, carbon from, let's say, cattle, uh, similar or different from carbon that's uh, associated with, let's say, fossil fuels. So we start on the left side of this graph here. What are fossil fuels? Oil, coal, and gas. That's carbon, ancient carbon that was in the ground for millions of years, for hundreds of millions of years. And over the last uh, seven or so decades, humanity has taken about half of all that carbon, that fossil carbon, out of the ground and then we burned it with cars, trucks, trains, planes, ships, and we added new additional CO2 to the atmosphere ever since. On the livestock side, things are a little different. The main greenhouse gas on the livestock side is methane. Where does the carbon, the C in the methane, where does that methane actually come, uh, that carbon actually come from? It comes from the atmosphere. Atmospheric CO2 during photosynthesis is taken on by plants. So plants take on the atmospheric CO2, they convert that, as you know, into oxygen and other things. <clears throat> but while some of the carbon stays above ground and becomes cellulose, in some cases starch, the majority of carbon goes below ground and is taken on first by the roots and then later by soil microbes, a process referred to as soil carbon sequestration. Uh, a lot of this is happening in New Zealand, where you have a lot of grazing going on. Uh, every time you have animals on pasture, you are doing what I just described here. You're sucking carbon out of the air, you're putting it into the ground, and as long as you don't till the ground, you're keeping it there. And that makes healthy soils a very important vehicle to our climate issues, because um, healthy soils can trap vast amount of carbon. It is believed that uh, soils store about one third of human caused carbon. And so it is very important to emphasize that. And it's very important to accelerate this process and which we can do by clever ways of grazing. For example, rotational grazing accelerates um, this process I just described. So of course our animals eat some of the above ground vegetation and when they do, uh, in, their, in their digestive tract, they produce some methane. The methane is belched out 
Some more is coming from the manure, but after about a decade, it's converted back into the carbon that it came from, atmospheric CO2 and water. So a constant source of methane, a constant herd, for example, will produce carbon uh, that goes through plants, through soils. Uh, it, it goes through the animal. The animal uh, converts it to methane. It stays in the atmosphere as methane for about a decade and becomes CO2 again. So a constant source of methane does not add additional warming to our planet. However, if we increase, then you uh, increase net concentrations of this gas. If we reduce methane, as I already said, we can induce cooling. We can reduce warming. A few um, bullets here with respect to US beef and dairy production and how it has changed over the years. We used to have about 140 million beef cattle in the United States. Today, we have about 90. So 50 million fewer beef cattle today versus 1970. But we are producing the same amount of beef today as we did uh, 50 years ago. On the dairy side, we used to have 25 million dairy cows. Today, we only have nine. But with these nine million, we are producing 60% more milk than we used to with 25. So we went from 25 down to nine, but we are producing 60% more milk with this much smaller herd. That means that the carbon footprint of a gallon or liter of milk is two thirds smaller today than it was in 1950. Uh, miraculous, if you think about it, uh, drastic reductions of herd sizes and drastic reductions of emissions while producing way more product. Colleagues of ours <clears throat> from Oxford University um, decided a couple of years ago to really um, undertake another look at uh, methane and how methane actually warms the planet. And they found that this GWP100 that I alluded to before, which is the way of comparing methane to CO2, um, that this old matrix is really uh, troublesome. Troublesome in a way that it does not really describe the impact of this gas on warming. And warming is what it's all about. That's why we care about greenhouse gases. Instead, GWP100 simply converts uh, methane into CO2e, into pretty much uh, emission equivalent units. So they years ago said that this old unit overestimates um, the impact of constant sources of methane on warming by a factor of four. Um, if you think about what that means, that, that's pretty remarkable because GWP100 is used all over the world to, to estimate the impact of methane sources on warming. But uh, it doesn't really do an appropriate job from constant sources and it doesn't do an appropriate job um, in reducing and in increasing uh, trajectories either. They instead, these Oxford colleagues, uh, developed a new matrix called GWP star. And this GWP star actually does look at the impact of methane uh, on climate over time. It looks at the rate of change of methane and how it affects warming. It warmed the planet in 1980 versus 2000 versus 2020 versus projected 2040. Um, this GWP star accounts for the short lifespan of methane and also for the atmospheric removal of this, uh, this gas. To my great um, joy, I found that the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, last year in their so-called AR6 report, um, mirrored that assessment. And I have circled it here and highlighted it. It says, by comparison, expressing methane emissions as CO2 equivalent emissions using GWP100 overstates the effect of constant methane emissions on global surface temperatures by a factor of three to four. Now, um, that is the matrix that is being used currently, just uh, to be very clear. And I think that uh, you should have a beef with that, that a unit is used to assess the impact of your industry on warming by a factor of three to four. So um, this is all published. Again, it's the IPCC AR6 report on page 123 that you will find this at. So why is it important that we get this right? Well, first of all, um, let me explain the differences, the main difference, uh, differences between two of the main gases. The one is CO2 and the other one is methane. 
So imagine you were to drive from home to work and it were 20 kilometers or so. When you burn gas, you put CO2 into the atmosphere. That's on day one. On day two, on day two, you on Tuesday, you drive the same distance. You add new and additional carbon to the atmosphere to the existing stock from the day before. On Wednesday, you drive again, and the story goes on. Every time you drive, you put new additional CO2 to the existing stock from the day before, the week before, the month before, the year before, the decade before, and so on. CO2 is considered a stock gas. Every time we burn fossil fuels, we add new additional carbon to the atmosphere. Currently, methane is treated with this GWP100 as if it were a stock gas too, as if every time your animals belch, that were new additional carbon added to the atmosphere. But is it? The answer is no, it's not. Methane is not a stock gas. Methane is a flow gas. It is not just produced, but it's also atmospherically removed. And as long as you keep a hertz size constant, you don't add additional uh, carbon to the atmosphere. And that means no additional warming to our planet. So um, remember, methane is a flow gas, not a stock gas. I give you a quick analogy to uh, explain again the differences between CO2 and methane and how both respective gases contribute to warming. And I use a bathtub analogy, okay? The first bathtub analogy is for CO2. Imagine a bathtub that, um, that only has a faucet, but no the faucet, whether it's on low, medium, or high, you add additional water to the bathtub, and that means water levels rise, 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 rise. Eventually, this thing will overflow. There is no drain. Now, the second analogy is the one for methane and how that plant, uh, warms the planet. So the methane uh, bathtub analogy is one where you have a faucet and you have a drain, and the drain is always open. The drain is always open, and that means um, that if you turn the faucet on normal, you put water into the bathtub, but an equal amount flows out. And therefore, the level stays stable and constant. No rising, no, no draining. If you have to turn the faucet down on low, then you're adding less water to the bathtub, then you let go of, and that means the water levels will go down. That's what happens when you reduce methane. Then warming goes down. Only if you crank that faucet for this analogy and that faucet of the bathtub on full, then you add more water than you let go of uh, through the drain. And then levels can rise, even though there's this removal. So this is the difference between a stock gas, CO2, versus a flow gas such as methane. And how that matters uh, in different scenarios is something I depict here. You see here how over 30 years on the x-axis, methane in the first scenario increases by 35%. So for example, if you're strongly growing cattle herds, um, then you would have that scenario of increasing methane. The second one is one where you hold your methane pretty stable over 30 years in a given locality, let's call that uh, New Zealand. So if you hold your methane stable or slightly reduce it, that's the second uh, scenario. The third one is one where we strongly reduce methane over 30 years by 35%. How would the increasing stable and the decreasing methane scenario look like using this old matrix GWP100. GWP100 would predict that in all three cases, we would add a significant amount of additional uh, CO2 equivalent emissions to our planet. But that is not true because if we reduce it, for example, here in the bottom, then we are um, reducing uh, not just carbon, but warming pretty substantially. And hence, the need for the new matrix GWP star, uh, which you see here, uh, if we increase methane by a lot, then indeed we are adding a lot of additional warming. You see this here X, north of the x-axis. We do not want to produce more warming this year than last year. Uh, sorry, more methane this year than last year, because if we do, then we add a lot of, uh, you know, that's, that's obviously a problem. In the second scenario, where we slightly reduce methane by 10%, you see no additional warming north of the x-axis. In fact, you see a negative sign in front of the number, indicating negative warming is a fancy word for, for cooling. You're now removing warming. In the third scenario here, where you reduce methane by 35%, you are reducing a lot of warming. Look how much um, blue there is south of the x-axis 
and again a negative sign in front of the number. This is very much analogous to uh, planting forests. Okay, if you reduce methane, you have the same impact as planting forests. Uh, you are reducing warming by reducing methane. Now the question will be: Is this achievable? Can we achieve a strong reduction of methane that leads to negative warming? Because if we were to be able to do that, then and if we were to reduce methane by a lot, then this reduction of methane, hence the reduction of warming, could offset other greenhouse gases our sector gives off, such as nitrous oxide. And that would lead to a point where at some point in the future, you reach climate neutrality, the point by which you're no longer adding additional warming to the planet, climate neutrality. So is this possible? To achieve that point, and I believe yes, it is possible. And in fact, I think here in California we are well underway in achieving that goal. Now, this here is a depiction again, one more time, of CO two versus methane and how two sources of CO two and methane contribute to warming. Imagine a power plant over thirty year uh, over thirty years increasing the amount of power produced, and as a result, a CO two emitted. Uh, that CO2 increase would lead to an exponential increase in the related warming. Why exponential? Because CO2 is additive. I showed you that earlier with this pyramid looking graph there. But what about, let's say, if you were to have a feedlot, a cattle feedlot with 10,000 cattle, you increase the, the herd size to 15,000 cattle, then this increase from 10 to 15 would increase methane over time. And that would lead to a linear increase of the related warming. How about we keep the power plant and the cattle herd constant? If we keep CO2 constant from our power plant, then that still leads to increasing amounts of warming because of the additive impact that CO2 has. Okay, every time we burn fossil fuel, we add new additional warming to our planet. But the same is not true for methane. If we hold our cattle herd at 10,000, let's say, then uh, that constant cattle herd will lead to constant methane and that will lead to constant warming from that methane. And now comes what's interesting. What happens if we reduce both CO2 and methane? Let's say our power plant were to go down over 30 years and eventually we shut it down. What would happen to the related warming? Well, to the surprise of many, the warming would still go up, even though we are reducing CO2, the warming still goes up. We have to go to net zero carbon here. We have to shut this thing down in order to have a plateau of warming. That's what it takes to, for us to, to get really a plateau and no additional warming. But look what happens when you reduce methane. When you reduce methane, you instantaneously reduce carbon and hence warming from our planet. And that really is a huge difference. I hope everybody can see. It is not true that methane is just a CO2 on steroids, just simply 28 times more powerful. And that's the end of the story, as would be suggested by GWP 100. Methane is a different beast. Okay? It has a different impact uh, on warming, as you can well see here in this third scenario. People ask me, Frank, is methane a super pollutant? And in my opinion, methane is not a super pollutant. CO2 is a super pollutant. To me, methane is more of a super opportunity because if we manage methane, rather than ignoring it, if we manage methane, we can reduce warming. And that makes us, our sector in animal agriculture, a potential sector that can be a solution to our climate woes. So can it be done? I just showed you what happens when you reduce methane by let's say 30, 35%. Can that be done? Well, here in California, we have a law that mandates a 40% reduction, 4-0, um, of methane by the year 2030. And at first our uh, farmers were very worried about this, but then they learned that the state uh, would financially support them in reducing methane. For example, by covering lagoons. You see here a covered lagoon, and uh, what's bulging out here underneath the cover is biogas. That's the gas that's generated in the animal manure. Now, 60% to 60 of that biogas is methane. And methane is high in energy. But rather than just burning that 
biogas and making power at the dairy for the dairy or for neighboring communities. That's something people did in the past. They're now taking this dairy biogas and they're converting it into renewable natural gas, RNG, which is a fuel for the transportation fleet, for trucks and buses and so on. This is what it looks like when you take dairy, renewable natural gas, and you put it into semi-trucks. Um, this is a, a really nice depiction, I think. Um, to me, this is the way to go. Okay? Why should dairies only produce milk if they can also produce energy, fuels? Uh, it's making up a significant income source for those operations. To me, methane is only a problem if you don't manage it. If you do manage it, it is turned from being a liability to being an asset. Can methane also be reduced from other um, pathways? Absolutely, it can. We have looked into feed additives to reduce methane um, from, from belching that animals do, that ruminant animals do. And we found that there are some additives out there that can reduce 10%. There are some additives out there that can reduce 40, 50% of enteric methane. So I'm quite of bullish uh, because I feel that in the next few years, we will have numerous more tools at our disposal to reduce methane uh, than we have today. And I think that we can do this, the reduction of methane, the reduction of our climate impact, while making significant income streams possible. We've done a prediction of what happens if we don't do anything, let's say for the California dairy industry, if we just have business as usual. You see here over the years on the x-axis, how a business of usual in gray would affect uh, warming equivalents on the y-axis. You can see here the gray columns suggest that business as usual will never get us to a point of climate neutrality, which would be reaching uh, and underscoring the x-axis. So at climate neutrality, we would not add any additional warming to our planet. But when you look at what a strong manure reduction of methane would do, that's light blue, versus a manure reduction of methane plus enteric um, fermentation reduction, then you see that in the near future, by the year 2027, our dairy sector can uh, breach through this x-axis, reach climate neutrality, and when it's south of the x-axis, it will actually take out more warming than it replaces, at which, at which point this sector will sell carbon credits to other sectors, for example, the fossil fuel sector. Uh, we already have situations, dairies, that sell their carbon credits to Shell, BP, um, BMW, and other companies. So I'm quite bullish that, carbon, that climate neutrality is a, a thing of the future. It is a goal that we should aspire to, and it is a goal that we can reach. Not just here in California, we can reach it all over the world. But a matrix, a way of quantifying the impact of these gases on climate, that is fit for purpose. And in my opinion, GWP100 and GWP20 are not fit for purpose for scenarios where you have constant emissions or decreasing emissions over time. Some people suggest we should just uh, uh, focus also on other areas, and I agree. It's not just uh, reducing emissions on a farm. What you see here is an average US family in front of all the food that's wasted every year. In the United States, 40% for zero of the food that's produced is never eaten. And uh, you might check your heads thinking, oh my gosh, this is unbelievable. Well, the same is true for most of the developed world. Most developed countries uh, waste that much food. Um, and these food waste, uh, this food waste occurs largely at the consumer level. So in your private households, as well as in restaurants. Even in developing countries of the third world, 40% 40, 40 of the food that's produced never make it to make it makes it to markets. And that is because uh, farmers have a harder time harvesting on time, uh, getting it to the distribution processing centers and so on. Uh, the food just never makes it to the consumer. Uh, worldwide, the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations estimates that about 40% of all food produced by farmers never makes it through a human digestive tract. Surely an area that we need to uh, put some emphasis into and some focus, but that's not to say that we can deflect off what we need to do in animal agriculture. We need to take this challenge seriously. It will not go away. We need to reduce particularly methane. And if we do, great things can happen. What's really important is that your policymakers understand that you farmers 
can be part of a climate solution if they work with you, preferably with a carrot approach and not with a cane approach. With that, I want to uh, come to a close here. Um, just want to mention uh, my CLEAR Center has put out some documents. One of them is a, a pathway to climate neutrality. Yes, it is for US, but uh, you can adopt and adjust it for New Zealand. It has Excel spreadsheets that allow you to, um, to put in uh, the data that are relevant for the New Zealand context. Uh, I also produced a YouTube video called Rethinking Methane. It's available uh, on YouTube and uh, it's for you to use for free. Uh, I also write a blog. This is the, the web address for the blog. Uh, on this blog, we discuss all different kinds of interesting issues around livestock and the environment, as well as other societal issues. And last but not least, uh, I'm on Twitter. GHG Guru is my Twitter handle. Uh, not the most humble one, but that's what it is. And I hope that you follow me. Thank you very much.